All right, animal ecology. Ecology is a course that you can take here at SVU. Many of you already have. And it is the study of an organism in its environment. So you're looking at both the abiotic and biotic uh, influences, contributing factors to their survival, reproduction, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so you're, you're not only interested in uh, a specific organism, but you're also interested in uh, the chemicals, the hydrological cycles, uh, biogeochemical cycles, the interactions between other organisms, and so on and so forth. We're going to try and put a lot of that information in one lecture, which is kind of hard, but we're going to take two days to go over this in class. So we're going to cover a few topics. First off is a niche. Niche is a total of all the resources that a species uses in its environment the prey can be considered its species um, niche, part of its species niche. The habitat then is where it's physically located in its environment, whether it's in a log, under a rock, habitat can change from season to season, um, or from even hours of the day, depending on the behavior of the organism. Uh, the fundamental niche is the resource a species is capable of using. I have two examples here. I've got the red-backed salamander on the top here, and you can see all the counties in Virginia where it is found. And then we've got the peaks of otter salamander, which is found in just a few counties, um, really on one mountaintop in Virginia. The realized niche, then, is the resources a species these actually uses in a community. So I don't know if the peaks of otter salamander could actually inhabit all the same areas as the redback salamander, but if it could, then its fundamental niche would be much bigger than its realized niche. So competition may be affecting these, the distribution of these two species and keeping the peaks of otter salamander restricted to just that mountaintop. All right, so we're going to move into population ecology. A population is a group of individuals that um, reproduces within a geographic area. And a deem, then, is a single geographic population. That's one cohesive unit. So you may have a, a deem that's like a, a small family social unit, like a pride of lions. Um, you may have multiple prides considered to be a deem. So demographics, then, is the study of those deems. Some of the things we're interested in population ecology include how many individuals are in a certain area, its density, where they go, how far uh, spaced they are in relation to each other. And when we look at ecology, populations are generally the basic unit of organization. So some of the demographic characteristics which contribute to our understanding of a deem or part of a population, thus demography, include sex ratio, how many males, how many females, and how many of those reproduce. Uh, we've got a bowhead whale here, and so we're going to use that as an example. And the bowhead whale is approximately 50-50. That's not always the case in organisms. Um, most a whales don't reproduce, bowhead whales don't reproduce till they are at least 25 years of age and so the adults would be 25 and older when anything under 25 generally is going to be a subadult down to um, a new newborn calf in its first year or second year um, and so on and so forth we have different ages uh, associated generally with reproduction and size dispersion are they clumped random uniform uh, so are they all working together in a social group? They would then be clumped. Are they uh, distributed evenly in, an, uh, in a landscape? Then they're probably competing against each other and have competitive territorial um, habitats. For bowhead whales, they live in small groups or sometimes are solitary. So they would be clumped. Distribution. Well, we can find bowhead whales from the Bering Sea to the Arctic coast in northwest Canada. Um, survivorship. And we can geographically, so not geographically, but graphically represent the survivorship of certain species 
which generally falls the same pattern for all the individuals in the population. So uh, a type one mortality is like humans, and I think bowhead whales would probably fall into this category as well. Mortality occurs mostly among the older individuals and the younger organisms generally survive to adulthood. They generally don't have very many, but they survive to adulthood. Type 2 is a constant rate of survival. So if you have five birds that are born, four live to one year, three to the next, two to the next, and one to the final year. Type 3 is high mortality among young. So trees are a great example of this. They produce tons of seeds. Very few of them actually um, sprout. Um, but those that do sprout live a long time. So the dynamics of a population really are just observed as a snapshot. We can, of course, put all those together and make extrapolations and other things um, which occur over time. But how it changes is called population dynamics and is a central question in ecology. Will this population grow or shrink and what are the contributing factors to that? There's a lot of organizations which are important. Uh, which find this important to understand and thus are involved in researching these things. So some of those for the bowhead whale include the North Pacific Research Board, which is going to fund research towards uh, these organisms. North Slope Borough Department of Wildlife Management. This is a species which is hunted, and so its numbers need to be monitored over time. They want to make sure that it's not shrinking and going into extinction. And then, of course, there's some primary research and going on in universities such as the University of Alaska Fairbanks and other departments. Um, will the fluctuations be major or minor is another question they will ask in association with whether it's growing or shrinking. All right, so we talked about density before. It's one of those population dynamics. To measure density, we can just look at the geographic area, look at how many new pop, new individuals are entering the population by a birth or immigration, and how many are leaving the population due to death and immigration. When we combine these together, we can get um, the change in population size. Birth and at births and immigrants minus deaths and immigrants equals the n, the number of individuals. Sorry, equals the change in population size. Uh, you, may, you may have a base population size, which then that those births, deaths, immigrants, and immigrants would add to. Intrinsic growth then looks at uh, one factor of population growth, which is the R, the per capita rate of increase. Um, and that's going to be calculated simply by taking the number of births per capita minus the number of deaths per capita. So R equals B minus M. Once you have that rate, you can understand how a population is growing or dying. This is exponential growth. It assumes an ideal environment where resources are not limited. And as long as you have a positive growth rate, you will have positive growth and it will show have this J-shaped curve. What happens if R increases or decreases? Well, you still get a J-shaped curve, just the steepness of the curve is going to change um, depending on if R is high or if R is low or if R is negative. Then you will have a decreasing population. Does exponential growth really happen? It seems like, well, in what situations do you have unlimited resources and the answer to that really in the long run is none nowhere but we have seen some experiments where they've been able to model exponential growth they put a bunch of caribou caribou on these islands with no predators and they had unlimited resources and they just gorged themselves and reproduced like crazy as you can see in that graph down there to the left but eventually they ran out of food they ate everything on the island there weren't any predators to kill them and so diseases and other density dependent factors were important for controlling their growth. And you can see that it wasn't just like a leveling off, it was a dramatic die off. So what happened was they overshot quite a bit of 
the number that would be sustainable on the island. Uh, if we ask about competition, well, if you have competitive um, individuals, competitive populations that are looking at the same resources and using the same resources, uh, then that's going to decrease the amount of uh, the rate at which they can grow in their population. So what happens if you out eat your resources, you out use your resources? Generally, most um, populations don't do that. And we can model the population change by increasing the complexity of the model by using the carrying capacity, abbreviated with the capital other letter K. So whereas our equation for exponential growth was just R times N, now we can have a second component in there with uh, the carrying capacity. And what happens is when we put in the numbers, we can show that the closer that you get to the carrying capacity, the slower the growth rate becomes. Once you hit then the carrying capacity, you won't have any more growth. You should have a leveled off population. If you overshoot the carrying capacity, then you are dooming yourself to a decrease below even what you had before. Now, there, the, the limits to the growth in a population include density and de independent and density dependent factors. Density independent factors are generally abiotic and affect a member of the population despite whatever their evolution or matching to their environment may be. So hurricanes can go through and destroy habitats, fires can do the same, and it doesn't matter how many are in that area, um, many of them will die because the fire would affect them regardless of whether the number of them are, that are there. However, the density dependent factors are, if you are in greater number, then the dangers are generally greater. Um, and so we're looking at biological agents such as disease. And at a greater number, more of them will infect each other and more of them will die from the disease. So to bring this back to humans, what about Earth's carrying capacity? What is it? How many humans can the Earth hold? That's something which, which has been many scientists have been trying to figure out and it's hard to come to any certain conclusion because depending on what variables you use and if you take into consideration how well uh, humans can adapt to their situation all this will go into it. It The estimates range from 1 billion to 1 trillion people but most estimate between 10 and 15 billion which we are approaching. Well what happens if we overshoot K? Hopefully not what happens with the caribou and we all have a population crash. All right, moving on to community ecology. So when you're looking at these different levels of biology, the community is smaller than the ecosystem, but is a group of populations, um, often of different species, living in the same area and their interactions. Interactions can be positive, negative, or neutral. This interaction between what looks like a coyote or a wolf and this chicken was uh, positive for the canid and negative for the chicken. I think that's a red wolf, that's my guess. All right, competition is a negative interaction between two species. Predation is positive for one, negative for the other. And then we have very tight knit associations called symbioses. Um, and there, when both are positively affected, it's mutualism. When one is positively affected and the other is unaffected, it's commensalism. And parasitism is another variation then of predation, really a variation of exploitation. All right, so competition occurs when organisms require the same limiting resource, and it becomes a negative influence on both. Um, you can have intraspecific competition, where the same species are competing. Here we have intraspecific competition. Um, intra-sexual uh, selection event where two males are fighting over access to a female. On the right we have inter-specific 
competition where a blue jay and a squirrel are competing for nuts. Interspecific uh, competition can lead to um, the divisioning of resources and the divisioning of niches, right? And so the pr principle of competitive exclusion is that no two species can inhabit the same niche at the same time and place. And so there must be some sort of distribution divvying up alteration in their niche so they um, then settle in different resource uses. Uh, resource partitioning then uh, can result in from adaptive radiation. We see this with the Galapagos finches and with uh, anolis lizards in uh, islands in the Caribbean where they will start to use all sorts of different resources in the same environment because uh, competition would not allow them to stay in the same exact area eating the same foods and so you get a division of resource use that's called resource partitioning um, character displacement also then relates to this because um, as you have niche overlap where they are competing for each other um, they can specialize on different characters which then allows them to specialize in different uh, ecological functions whether it's the food they eat or the place they inhabit in the canopy all right predation exploitation is pretty simple uh, the predator eats the prey uh, herb herbivore is a predator predator of sorts uh, it will eat plants and destroy the plant and consume it carnivore is a non-autotrophic um, eater of prey which would include that lion whereas herbivore would be that when we look at these across different species in an area, we can create what we call a food web, uh, which is a, a diagram illustrating the different types of uh, interactions of who eats who in an environment. So well, you may have learned this as a food chain in the past, but in reality, uh, there's a lot of dynamics in eating uh, different things in an environment many different species mean eat lots of different things um, and then that can create lots of dynamics in population growth we have autotrophs as we mentioned before those that eat um, at the bottom of the food webs plants and photosynthetic organisms these are called primary producers heterotrophs that eat the first level are called primary consumers and uh, secondary consumers eat primary consumers, tertiary consumers eat secondary consumers, and so on and so forth. Detritivores then eat dead and decaying matter, and they then are responsible for help recycling nutrients into the environment. All of them, of course, are involved in recycling nutrients um, by eating things, making um, resources available, um, helping process the food and creating waste and all that waste then is available for detritivores and scavengers. What we see because of laws of thermodynamics is that each transfer of energy on the trophic scale does not transfer 100%. In fact, it doesn't do very well at all. And when we measure things like biomass or um, you can use other measures to show this as well, energy available and so on. Uh, only about 10% of each trophic level, of the trophic level below it, uh, is there. All right, and so that limits how many trophic levels we can we can have. This is called the ecological pyramid. So we don't have very many top predators, um, but they are absorbing quite a bit of energy if you think of all the trophic levels underneath it. All right, moving on to symbiosis, where one species lives on the other. The symbiont is this generally the smaller, the host is the larger. There's three um, different types we'll go over. The first is mutualism, where both are beneficially um, contributing to each other. Bees and flowers are a great example of this. Bees drink the nectar, so they get a benefit, and then they take pollen from one flower to the other, so they fertilize um, the different flowers. 
Commensalism is where one benefits and the other does not get a benefit. Uh, example, barnacles living on whales, remoras hitching rides on sharks. Um, one is directly using the other one, the other, the other one can sometimes not even notice the other, person is, the other organism is there. Parasitism, on the other hand, is, is where a organism feeds off of another. So here we have a bunch of eggs that have been laid. on the parasite. Oh, hold on just a second. Sorry about that. Um, right, so the parasite feeds off of the host. Generally it doesn't kill it, but will reduce its fitness. So you still have this positive-negative relationship. All right, all of this feeding and interaction between living and non-living things um, can create then our nutrient cycles or also called biogeochemical cycles. We have a carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, water cycle, phosphor cycle, and um, water will pass through plants as it goes up into the atmosphere. It is then a, um, absorbed or different animals will drink it. Um, and uh, then it will rain and the, anyway so the whole thing is uh, interconnected with both living and non-living processes all right lastly we have biodiversity which is the different types of species in an area um, there are have been a lot of great studies on biodiversity uh, which have to do with islands because you kind of have a more restricted geographical area and you can uh, keep track of um, how many species come in and out based on the size and location to and proximity to the mainland. Speciation then a divergence between one species into many species or two or more can then lead to diversity. Habitat fragmentation generally leads to increase in speciation because it opens up a lot of different resources within an environment, a lot of different ways that natural selection can act on uh, different organisms and thus create more diversity. Extinction decreases diversity and a large geographic range generally decreases the chances of an extinction. So. Um, we mentioned crow species in class. If they inhabit a very large area, it's very unlikely that one event or even multiple events will cause them to go in, e extinct. Um, however, there is this kind of trade off between speciation and extinction. Islands have both high rates of speciation and high rates of extinction, um, whereas the mainland because there's a lot more geography, there's a lot more geographic area, there's a lot more species, and it's not as restricted in the number of species that are able to access that area, you have lower rates of speciation and lower rates of extinction. All right, guys, that's it. We'll take a couple days to review this in class.